So this is part two of my interview with Max Deutsch. If you haven't already, please check out part one and so it all makes sense. But this is one of my favorite pieces of content. I love this guy, so I hope you enjoy it. In May, I built the software part of a self-driving car. So what that means is based on the video feed, of a road, I taught my computer how to drive the car, right? So how to steer, how to brake, how to accelerate it. And I think out of all my challenges, this one will age the worst, meaning that like in a year, that's going to be one line that you copy and paste from GitHub and uh, you call it a day. The point there with that challenge was to say, okay, building a self-driving car might seem like this like super technical Herculean task, but really a large part of it was just like getting started and wading through what was out there. And, you know, I didn't have to build it from, from the the metal layer. So, um, that was an interesting one. Um, but very different than some of the other challenges. Yeah. I think for me as a, as someone that doesn't program, um, it's hard to comprehend the difficulty. It sounds absurdly difficult, you know, backflips very easy for you to put yourself into the position of someone doing that or a language, but, um, that project, you seem to just like, flow through it pretty fast so yeah i think the, the hope with the blog post for that one is to say this might sound impressive perhaps but here's what i did and it's like not that many steps and it wasn't super technical and you know that's the crazy thing with a project like this which is when people hear about i'm sure your youtube videos or read my blog they're like wow you learned that in a month that's such a short period of time but from my perspective it's like no a month is a really long period of time when's the last time that you spent an hour every single day deliberately and intensely focusing on learning one thing, right? Like doing that every day for 30 days is actually so much more than most of our our efforts, right? So I think there's a overestimation for how long things take and an underestimation for how long like a a month could could be, if that makes sense. I mean, I totally agree. You know, I think that people like myself and you, we get better at that process. Like going into month 12 now, my strategy is so much more condensed than it was in month one. But at the end of the day, I still could figure it out in month one. It was a little bit more trial and error and there's a little bit more pain. But um, I think if people were jumping into it, then I think that they would have similar results. I think exactly what you just said is the big thing, which is the biggest difference between you and the challenges you're doing and someone that, that isn't is just that you gave it a try. Like you had enough confidence that it might turn out okay that you started learning is not this magical secret process that only a few people know the tricks to it's like it's exactly what i mean it's the same thing as like losing weight it's like you know what the the, what you have to do it's like eat your diet and exercise how much how much do you find the youtube channel as a a motivator I, i i don't know if you just do a end of challenge video or if you're doing like um, halfway point. But for me, because I sort of committed up front, then I felt like I needed to every day keep working towards something. Whereas I feel like if I just had to report back at the end, um, I might have less motivation. So I'm curious to see how you're feeling about that. Yeah. So definitely the, having the channel and having something that I'm publicly releasing is huge. Um, so I just finished yeah. 90 days bodybuilding where I was training seven times a week. I was eating on a set wow. diet and I really didn't want to deviate. You know, I had um, like a gala ball. I had my girlfriend's birthday. I had weddings. I had all of these things yeah. during that 90 days and I didn't want to touch a drink. I brought my hard boiled eggs. I brought my rice um, to every event that I went to. And so I don't think that I would have necessarily had to that high degree um, of a discipline if I didn't have that um the the video that i was releasing i do think that to some degree i backload it i often find that like week one and two i'm loving the challenge i'm like oh this is so much fun and i feel like i'm picking it up really fast and then week like three is like this kind of breaking point where i feel like i should be closer to the 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 thing that i'm trying to achieve and if i'm trying to learn a kick flip i'm like whoa i'm you know kicking up the board and like it's all going so well. And my coach says that I'm, I'm getting this really fast. Then my week three, yeah. I'm like, I need to land this right now or like and edit a video. So there's, a, there's right. this kind of um, pressure point that just kind of forces, kicks things into gear. But I, you know, I think for a lot of people having deadlines um, and having some sort of commitment uh, really helps the motivation. And for me, like I know that I'm going to learn Spanish next month because I've set that as a goal. So I know yeah. that I'm going to be speaking Spanish. But if I said out of the context of this, um, this YouTube channel, I'm going to try to learn it next month. 
maybe I would, maybe I wouldn't, maybe something would distract me. So having something more um, constrained around it really helps me. Okay, so where were we? So June, the challenge was to develop musical perfect pitch. Yeah. And so what this one looked like was I used a website called tonedear.com and it would randomly generate musical notes in any octave. And my goal was to, to learn how to just consistently, without any reference, identify any of those musical notes. You know, I grew up playing music and I always thought that perfect pitch was something you were born with or or not. The July was to solve a Saturday New York Times crossword puzzle. Yep. Um, and this one actually also goes back to the same Anders Ericsson book on yep. deliberate yep. practice. And there's a line in that book where he says, almost everything can be approached from this methodology of clear deliberate practice, except for a few things like, I don't remember what the other two, but his example of something that you couldn't train in this way was crossword puzzles. And so I thought it would be a fun challenge to see if I could come up with a more systematic way of training crossword puzzles. Yeah, for me reading along that, I thought your approach was very interesting, building your own software um, that kind of helps uh, learn all these different clues. And those, I guess there was a component of memorization and then a component of just figuring out the kind of structure of how crosswords work. So I think for that one, probably more so than other challenges, your approach was actually, and your ability to think through kind of problem solve was the thing that really got you over the line. Would you say that's fair for that challenge? Yeah, I think that's true. And you're know, talking to what, or something I mentioned before was like the first few challenges ha had a very clear approach, like to memorize a deck of cards or learning to solve a Rubik's cube or the drawing, like those were very defined. And then as I started moving along in the challenge, there was a less clear approach for developing musical perfect pitch or solving a crossword puzzle. So the art, the way I designed the project also to, was to have a little bit of that arc. And I gotcha. figured, I would get better from the process standpoint towards the end anyway. Gotcha. So August was one continuous set of 40 pull-ups. And this one's the most like, um, well, maybe other than the chest, this one's the one where people are a little bit uh, torn about it because they were half pull-ups. Yep. You know? So I was going down to yep. here, not. So, so I get it. But on the first day, that's what I declared, right? Which is... You know, my goal is to do 40 of these 90 degree pull-ups, definitely taking a little bit of uh, heat for the, the, the quality of the pull-up or calling it a pull-up, which yeah. I'm okay with. I think that's inevitable. You know, you put yourself out there, you're going to find some people that cut you down for a technicality. I remember for me, I went and tried to see how many 90 degrees pull-ups I could do yeah. just to try to quantify how impressed I should be. And I did like 19 yeah. or 20. I was like, okay, that's actually very impressive. Is there two more challenges after that? Yeah, two more. So the, the, the second to last one was continuously freestyle rapping for three minutes. I'm on the mic. I'm just had to tour this. Yeah, you heard it. Yeah, I'm going to be spinning it perfect because I deserve it. And I'm going to be spinning it like it's my service. Which was a ton of fun. Um, again, you know, this is like more of a subjective challenge of me just saying here's how I want to sound as a rapper and like here's some of the videos and then trying to work towards that. That's that's definitely something that it's a maybe for me in the future. I think particularly with using video as a format, it's something that it could be a really fun video. Yeah, very cool. Yeah. And then finally, uh, probably the most, well definitely the most ambitious challenge of the 12. Yeah, so the most ambitious challenge and one that I hadn't planned on but came knocking and uh, happened was to defeat world champion Magnus Carlsen at a game of chess. Yeah. You know, the backstory is back when I was working at my software development company, I shipped a mobile app called Rightspeed, which was a speed listening app, and it was covered in TechCrunch and Wired Magazine. And eventually, one of the writers from the Wall Street Journal was writing a front page story on speed listening. And reached out to me because of Rightspeed and interviewed me. And ultimately, Rightspeed became like a big part of that story on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. And so I was like, okay, this, this guy had a little bit of clout, at least, you know, inside the organization. So I decided like, hey, why not just send him a link to my blog and see what he thinks. And he had been the sports writer for the Wall Street Journal. And I guess chess is a sport. So he had been covering Magnus Carlson and uh, knew his team really well. And so he proposed the idea of, would I be able to connect you with Magnus for a game? 
contingent on the Wall Street Journal covering it. And I was like, contingency or not, this sounds yeah, impossible. Yeah. But like, yeah. you know, if Tiger Woods came up to me and said, hey, you want to play a, a round of golf? I would say, I don't play golf, but but yes. So yeah. um, that's sort of how it happened. I mean, ultimately, I, I figured it was going to be effectively a 0% chance that I'd win the game. But I figured that the challenge would inspire one of the most interesting and unusual learning challenge out of, you know, all the other ones. So, and I think, I think it delivered on that promise. Spoiler alert, Magnus won the game, but um, it, it was a super cool experience. Yeah. I personally loved watching the video and uh, I just found it, I was, you know, laughing and really enjoying it because it was just kind of a beautiful way to end uh, a really cool project. But I know I a lot of people that were really into chess got like offended by the idea that someone could beat Magnus Carlsen. Uh, you know, how did you find that response and the kind of the media reaction? When I agreed to play the game, I knew they were going to cover it in the journal. I didn't know it was going to be the front page story. I had no clue that the, you know, the article and the videos were going to be viewed like tens of millions of times. Like, it, you know, it got way more eyeballs than I ever expected. And obviously that was not the reason I did the project. But, you know, a lot of great opportunities came from that. But also with eyeballs came a little bit of, uh, you know, judgment or ne negativity and so i would say on one hand there was a group of people that reached out that were super fascinated with the approach i was taking so like i, I talked for a while with this guy from google brain who was doing machine learning research and just talking about like how can we take the approach further so you know just to to, to explain the the general premise of my approach was right now we're trying to build or in the past have tried to build computers that play chess like humans, could I make this human play chess like a computer? So that was the, the basis of the, or the, the thought experiment, right? And so there was a ton of interest and positivity from like the machine learning community that sort of understood what I was trying to do. And then on the other side, the chess community thought that I had no clue what, what I was doing, which is probably true, but also just thought it was like a waste of Magnus's time and rude that I would ever challenge him or... Um, that I thought I would win or anything like that, which, you know, most of the sort of negativity that I received from the chess community was from people that just didn't have all the information about the project and what I was thinking and the background and how it happened and all of that. And so I can't even blame these people. Like from what they saw, they were exactly right in their observation, which is like some random kid says, I can defeat world champion Magnus Carlsen at a game of chess in a month. Like if that's the story that you read, yeah, obviously I wouldn't like that guy either, yeah. you know? So I totally get it. I think the lesson here and the reason why, despite all of that, my view on the experience and the project was super positive is because it's very easy for a lot of people to, you know, want to please their parents or others. And I think if you experience an event where you reach some sort of like failure or pushback or negativity in the in the way that I did, you know, from some of these comments, I think if I wasn't the one that had made those decisions, but someone else had made those decisions for me or it was something that I didn't want to do, then those would have hit really hard. It was like, wow, I did this thing I didn't even want to do and I'm getting all this flack for it. But it was something I wanted to do and then I really enjoy doing. And the truth is, 80 percent of the response was positive. But I can tell you that despite everything I just said, the 20 percent feels like a million times more than yeah. any of the positive comments. Of course. Yeah, I mean, so you, yeah, I totally agree. You were acting with integrity. You were acting in alignment to your values. It's, it's similar with me. For the 99 positive comments that I get on all my videos, there's the one person that says that I'm faking it. Particularly, my most popular video is a skateboarding video. Yeah. A lot of people think that I was secretly hiding my skateboarding abilities and I could kickflip and, you know, um, beforehand. Um, you know, there's just random things like that. And yeah, you feel good about your actions and that's all you can do in life. And I think these are valuable things to go through. Yeah, it's really interesting you say that because, you know, one of the things I said at the very beginning of this was when I was a kid and I saw someone that could do something that I couldn't do, my natural reaction was that's super cool that a human being can learn to do that. I'm just like that person. Let me learn. And I think it's been interesting to see from the blog how different people react, right? Like, so for you, for example, you read the blog and you said, whoa, this is super cool that someone is like, that's very similar to me is doing all these things. I want to do all these things also. And then you, you did, right? Spot on. Or another common reaction is like, oh, Max or Max must be special in some capacity. And you know, that's, so that's amazing for him that he can do that. But this is not something for me. Um, which is obviously a, a limiting belief and one that I don't think is true. And then there's the third category, which is like, 
the only way that he could possibly do this is if he's lying and faking and cheating and all of that. I think from the perspective of just like viewing life and the opportunities and trying to understand what your personal possibilities are, it's always best to assume good intent. It's always best to assume like what's being presented. I think it gives you an opportunity to take something away from the project rather than just completely shutting down. People always ask like, I wanna be more productive. Like, how do I be more productive? And my response is like, in pursuit of what? Why do you wanna be more productive? Like, what is the thing that you actually wanna do? And I think a lot of times we, we're so focused on trying to optimize our productivity that we don't think about what we're trying to be productive for. Uh, 